Ani Bethleponse here, Anishinaabe, Métis, and Irish designer of Thunderbird Strike, a lightning searing side scroller where you play as a Thunderbird striking lightning down at big giant mining trucks. And most recently, When Rivers Are Trails, a point and click Indigenous spin on Oregon Trail with contributions from 30 Indigenous writers. On behalf of Indigenous game devs, thank you for joining in on Night of the Indigenous Devs, a vital step for self-determined Indigenous games, brought to you by Imaginative and Achimo Stawanon Games. Indigenous Game Devs is a community for Indigenous game developers from aspiring to established, where we showcase our work and share resources. If you're Indigenous and interested in or involved in making games, Connect with us at indigenousgamedevs.com. Miigwech and enjoy the show. Megan Bernasikasan, Apatawa Kosisan, Hamilton, Ontario, Nuchin. Hi everyone, I'm Megan Byrne and I am Apatawa Kosisan or Metis from Ontario and I was born and raised in Hamilton, Ontario. I would like to welcome you to Night of the Indigenous Devs. I am speaking to you as the owner and lead game designer of Achimostawastan Games, an Indigenous owned and majority Indigenous staffed indie game studio out of Ontario. We are so excited that you could come tonight. I am overwhelmed at the support and the joy people have gotten out of Night of the Indigenous Devs last year when we were at the Bell Tiff, the Tiff Bell Lightbox as part of Imaginative. And again, we're part of Imaginative this year, but online. And thank you for joining us wherever across the world that you may be and whichever tor territory or traditional lands that you rest on. As a game designer and an Indigenous person, it has always been a struggle to speak truthfully about what I want to speak about in video games. Too often are we told that we have to present our Indigeneity in video games in a particular way. And when I was with Imaginative last year and developed Night of the Indigenous Devs, I wanted to create a space where Indigenous people could just be game devs and just show their stories the way they want to show their stories without having to perform their Indigeneity, without having to be grounded in history, without having to be educational to anyone else. This is just about supporting Indigenous game devs in the way that they want to be seen. And so I'm so excited that this year we're offering these five amazing projects by these five amazing creatives and groups from across Canada and the world. As Beth said, uh, as part of the Indigenous Game Dev Group, we're starting to create spaces beyond just Night of the Indigenous Devs, where throughout the year we can be supportive and be that space for Indigenous Game Devs to speak the way they want to speak and talk about games and show games the way they want to show these games. And so if you are Indigenous, if you enjoy video games and making video games, or if you enjoy making tabletop games or role-playing games, definitely come and check it out on indigenousgamedevs.com and ask to join our Discord. And so I say thank you to you for joining us. I say thank you to all of our creatives for being a part of this event. I say thank you to Imaginative for being our host and supporting Indigenous developers and media creators from across the world and in all the forms of screen-based media that we want to be seen on and play with. And a big, big miigwech 
to eSight Games for being our lead uh, sponsor of this event. So without further ado, let's play these games. Shandine Yazi Woodward. Uh, I'm an art director on Button City and a co-founder of my studio Subliminal. So Button City is a narrative adventure game. It's um, a cute, colorful, low-poly game about a uh, fox and his friends are trying to save their local arcade shut down. It's a game about friendship, community, there's some light puzzling, there's some arcade games. Um, it's about a lot of kid culture in there and just uh, embracing um, a love for arcades, nostalgia, and uh, um, growing up and saving the things that are important to you. So Button City started off as an original concept of mine about three years ago. I had just started learning um, 3D modeling. I was kind of just messing around in Blender. Um, I was making low poly characters and one of the first um, projects that I made was a little fox on a on an island with a house and people really started enjoying that and it kind of um uh it just kind of took off and the fox ended up becoming like our main character on that character but he was he always started off as like a cute little little shy boy uh <laughs> i was originally drawn to low poly for um for its simplicity and for the aesthetic uh, i use a limited color palette in the game they're probably about like 64 colors, maybe a few more. And um, uh, we don't have any light sources, so all of the placement of the shadows and the colors are deliberately um, kind of laid out on the 3D models. So it's an interesting hybrid. I came from a 2D art background. Um, I used a lot of like vector illustration, and it kind of felt like um, making vector art in 3D. Uh, by using low poly, I got a focus on Kind of building this game out with um, very simple, deliberate shapes, but a lot of the the pieces are very like funky and um, they don't have a lot of detail. But the goal was to create kind of like a visual rhythm by taking a lot of smaller objects and really setting them into a world that felt like felt lived in. So having a limited palette combined with having um, like this low poly, very, uh, very minimalistic approach to the building out art and characters and worlds. Um, it was, it was very, very challenging and fun at the same time. Um, I had to be very considerate about like what colors work together, um, how to build simple objects out of like the fewest um, shapes and like edges and points possible. Um, like for most um, for most cylinders or like a little coffee cup, it would have like five sides, and um, it was it was really fun. I'm incredibly excited and thankful to be part of such indigenous game developers. It really is an amazing community, and um, I'm so happy that I could lend my voice to this. And I hope you all enjoy Buttons. Thank you.
Dance, a subiest, this is My name is Kira Lightning. I'm from Samson Cree Nation. I am a graduate student at the University of Alberta, and I am the writer and designer for the game Miquam. Uh, Dante, I'm Kaylee Lightning, and I'm also from Samson Cree Nation. Um, I'm currently attending my fourth year of Indigenous Environmental Studies at Trent University. Um, and I'm the artist for Miquam. So how did we develop this game, too? <laughs> uh, our whole, I guess, passion for this came from going to Imaginative um, just randomly last year for the first time and seeing all the cool creators there and going to Night of the Indigenous Devs and for drinks afterwards with everyone was like really what got the ball rolling for us. It just inspired us so much. Um, and that night we said to each other, we've got to, we've got to do something and get it in next year. <laughs> yeah. We didn't really start trying to make anything until just before like the submission time, like we kept saying we're going to. <laughs> um, but we were talking about like designs all year, but we like floated a whole bunch of different types of games that we might do, like all kind of visual novels, because uh, we love visual novels and we always play them together. But you're a 2D artist and I write and love visual novels. So I thought I really want to try to write one. And so we just had to figure out like the right software and stuff to use. Um, and then kind of the tea making mechanic took a bit to really get to. Mm -hmm. And that was kind of, that was inspired by a few of my favorite visual novels slash like more than visual novel games like Valhalla, Cyberpunk Bartender, especially. Uh, Cause I loved the idea that like, instead of influencing the storyline through your like choice of dialogue, you would influence the storyline through what drinks you choose to serve to somebody. So we wanted to kind of like indigenize that mechanic by making it tea. And I love to learn about plants and about herbalism. So um, we designed that whole thing around uh, like actual plants and the ways that they're sorted into elements in some traditions. And we've always wanted to make something together. I just remembered that. <laughs> <We'd> like, <Yeah. laughs> for like years, we've always been saying we should make something together since you're the writer and I'm the artist. Um, and I remember we wanted to make a graphic novel or like a show or a cartoon or something. And then I don't know why we never thought of visual novel until <laughs> yeah, like we play them all the time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, we play them all the time. And I, I play a lot of like little ones that are just like made by people independently. But I don't know, it never occurred to me that we could do that. <laughs> but it was a lot of work, though. Mm -hmm. um, what else? So Mikwam is kind of set in a fantasy indigenous alternate world. And that was because we really wanted to have freedom to like explore with our imaginations, like a storyline that deals with things that are real and personal, but to not feel like tethered to needing to represent specific people or specific places or specific traditions. And then I say the part of like there's a lot of pressure on indigenous artists to like create stuff within this bubble that people think it should look like um and to make sure you're always mm -hmm. representing things accurately and um stuff like that so we really wanted to kind of get out of that to just be able to do what we want in this universe mm -hmm. And I think it's really it's really legit that we do have a lot to consider. And so I, I did consider those things, but like representation. Um, but I, it's so important to be able to express ourselves without like having those spaces to actually just like express ourselves and feel that freedom. Mm -hmm. And that like, just like any other people, we can have imaginations that are not just tethered to the past or to what we've been taught. Mm -hmm. um, what else did we not talk about? <laughs> oh, um, the importance of having it look nice and having the nice music and the nice um, not setting, but like, and not vibe, but like, you know. <laughs> vibe, vibe is a good word, I think. Vibe, good vibes. <laughs> um, yeah. And for it to be relaxing to play. Yeah. And for everything to be cohesive with like all of the interface um, and the color scheme and all of that. Mm hmm. Yeah, one of my favorite things about visual novels is how kind of relaxing they are. To me, they're just so immersive and especially some of them, like when they have good music and good looks and just like a vibe <laughs> that is relaxing. And uh, so we want it to be something that would just make people feel good. Mm -hmm. And like, maybe it ignite the imagination of other people too. Mm -hmm. And we've really built way more of a story than is captured in this little bit, um, partly because learning how to use all the tools and getting all that set up took so much time and effort. Um, but there is way more to the story about Kukan and about um, more characters that we have made but haven't been put in yet that will be coming at some point. <laughs> game we used to play <laughs> you sucked <laughs> count to 10 hey hey are you asleep 
What are you doing? Haven't you heard? No one knows where Victor is. He left our program after Liam passed. You've got to check out where he was staying. See if you can find out where he went. We don't want him to end up on the streets. You know how talented he is. Well, what are you waiting for? Hurry up, get up. Hi, I'm Lee in Ireland. I'm the Executive Director at the Urban Society for Aboriginal Youth, or USA. And I am the writer and producer on Finding Victor, which is a virtual reality escape room that we created um, in 2019. Finding Victor is, um, was created because we were trying to um, come up with ways to support youth that were at risk of homelessness and to have conversations about reaching out for supports and accessing services that were available to them. And that was like a really important part of this game was to encourage youth to access resources, solve problems and build skills. Unlike other VR creators, we're a charity. So we work to um, create supports and games and resources that are educational and support uh, social justice um, issues and change. And that's a really big component of what Finding Victor is all about. Initially, Finding Victor was actually a um, real life escape room. We did a pop-up event in 2017 where we had over 100 um, Indigenous kids come from various schools throughout Calgary and they um, solved clues and puzzles and interacted with um, each other and teams to solve puzzles and find the story about Victor. Um, and that was really inspiring to us and we wanted to offer that um, experience to others through virtual reality. Um, the story of Victor is about a young man who loses his best friend Liam um, to suicide and he is struggling with depression and loss and um, he's in child welfare which is a very common issue among uh, the kids that we serve and he's just feeling disconnected and hopeless and that's where you as the player in finding victor start you're a friend of victor's um, you wake up you get a phone call from a youth worker asking you to help find victor and um, you start with um, this party house where he's gone to kind of couch surf and get away from his foster family and you have to solve some clues. You learn that Victor's an artist and he's kind of struggling to find himself and that his friend um, has been lost. We also show a letter from child welfare. We show a letter, um, a picture of his grandmother from residential schools. And we try to bring in this legacy of um, intergenerational trauma and um, you know, the ideas of hardship that cause homelessness and kind of these build these connections between why someone might end up homeless. And then you follow um, Victor escaping that situation and ending up on the streets where, you know, he creates his artwork and he gets a pamphlet um, and some information learning about some programs that he can utilize his artwork um, in, a, in a more uh, positive way. And, um, and then you find Victor in a youth center. So he's actually accessed some of those supports. He's got a locker, he's created a mural, and then he's successfully been housed. And so we really wanted to show that like transition from you know getting into trouble, doing some sort of um, interacting negatively, dealing with some trauma, and then making that kind of journey towards um, successful housing, finding yourself and being more connected to your culture. Um, and I think we successfully achieved that through kind of these um, internal dialogues that were recorded by um, an actor named Telly James. He recorded these internal dialogues of Victor um, and the struggles that he was having. And then we were able to have Stacy De Silva, um, who's another actress in the city, um, act as the youth worker to develop the hint and clue system. And this is encouraging the, the player to move along and know what's next uh, for them and, and kind of lead them down their journey a little bit. Um, I think something that's really interesting is that we named it Finding Victor because 
we wanted to have that kind of nod to smoke signals and that, you know, hey, Victor, which um, most Indigenous people kind of reference when they're talking about uh, movies that are really important to our community and our people. Um, you know, the inspiration for this was a lot of Indigenous youth in our programs are kind of these graffiti aerosol artists and they're kind of young and they're finding themselves and they're dealing with some struggles that no young person should have to deal with. And once they kind of embrace art and expression um, and find their voice, they become, you know, leaders and change makers in our community. And so we kind of wanted to follow that um, through line with this project, which um, I think we did quite successfully. It was really important to us to include um, musicians and artists. So uh, we had a uh, graffiti artist come in and use king spray and tilt brush to create the murals and artwork you see throughout the game. Um, and so including like a strong indigenous artist in that and having that kind of persona, um, I think was really, really effective in, in the inclusion of lots of indigenous people through a layered approach to the game. And then we also sought out musicians. So um, each level and the introduction and end both have different um, indigenous musicians that have provided their music to uh, Finding Victor, which is super cool. Overall, um, the game has been super successful. We've demonstrated it to tons of people and, um, you know, the feedback has been overwhelmingly positive, which is great. You know, we really liked this kind of comic book style and this not um, overly indigenous traditional um, piece that we've kind of done in the past. Um, and that's been appealing to a lot of young indigenous people who maybe aren't as connected with their tradition or culture um, as we'd like. But um, that's been really appealing to them and it's been really interesting. Overall, I loved working on Finding Victor. I love the kind of style and the, kind, the urban feeling that it has. And I think that it offers a lot of really interesting learnings and it's really just a fun game. It's fun to solve puzzles and to um, kind of have that fun progression through the different levels. And I think that we integrated those fun aspects with the learning aspects really well. And I hope that people that are playing it really enjoy um, finding the journey and finding Victor. He's got a locker at Yusei now. Go find him. You didn't know that? You know how much candy I bankrolled from these machines when I was a kid? Oh yeah, he's really something. Yeah. Do it for my brother, do it for my cousin. Do it for my sister, do it for my mother, do it for my family because I don't love no yeah. others. Oh. Yeah, he's really something. I'm not sure what Victor's locker combination would be. Play some basketball, get your mind off it, then figure it out. Family, this is how the story goes. I was always chilling on my own. Never felt like I belonged. The Illuminati. The Illuminati created us. They wanted to build a god with their own hands, and instead, they created us. Just because I'm made of silicone and aluminium, I must be doing something wrong. That's machine stereotyping, that is. That's reality, that is. Machines are second-class citizens. Humans are sentient persons by default, ma'am. They have personhood by heredity. There are thousands upon thousands of overqualified slum dwellers. Aloha everyone, I'm Chris Miller, also known as Silver Spook, a Native Hawaiian activist, kia'i, or protector of Mauna Kea here in Hawaii, and an indie game developer and also the creator of Neofeud. 
Neofeud is a cyberpunk adventure game where a cyborg social worker, an ex-convict sentient robot, and a socialist princess take on a cabal of neo-feudal trillionaire CEO slash kings who live in floating golden palaces above endless polluted terrestrial slum. I often describe my work not as science fiction but as stylized journalism with futuristic characteristics. The art, stories, and gameplay of Neofeud are a direct reflection of my upbringing and experiences as a native Hawaiian STEM teacher for the underserved youth of Honolulu's inner city. Teaching robotics, programming, and sustainability is an often difficult, stressful, and even Kafka-esque endeavor. Being in one of the richest, most beautiful places on earth, yet dealing with families with working parents who are living out of a van or sleeping on the street. It's hard trying to keep kids out of gangs, off of drugs, and on a path towards better opportunities, such as the ones that I had growing up in a slum area of paradise while going to an upscale private school. Hawaii is known for its postcard Corona commercial scenery, but it is not all fun and sun for everyone who actually lives here. I grew up a native Hawaiian on the not so nice side of the coconut trees where the tour buses avoid. My parents and parents' parents have lived in poverty stricken area of Kalihi Palama, cleaning for teaching the kids of or dancing fake plastic hula for the profit of mostly white and foreign millionaire and billionaires of Hawaii. I am a third generation neo-feudal serf. My friends in the neighborhood lived 20 to a house surviving on ramen and spam from food stamps, just dirt poor. On weekends, we would run through the forest barefoot playing games like Rock War, which involves whipping rocks at each other and trying not to get bloodied. They were wild kids, but we had good times building tree houses and cannonballing into tin roof, a big pond in the back of the valley. But then on Monday, my siblings and I would all pile into a cheap old Toyota Corolla and dad would shuttle us off to an elite college prep school that he could only afford because he taught there and we got free tuition, which is currently $19,000 a year, K-12. to uh, Punahou, Obama's school, is right in the area and is currently $30,000 a year. At this school, everyone didn't have holes in their shoes. They came to school in Mercedes and limos and dodge ball was illegal to avoid lawsuits. I was an overweight brown Hawaiian kid from the ghetto amongst a lot of wealthy, fairer skinned uh, whites and Asians. And as you might imagine, I was singled out along class and racial lines. In Gibsonian cyberpunk terms, it was like w waking up in the sprawl and going to school in the Villa Straylight and then returning home to the sewer every night with just a few coloring books about ancient Hawaiians who are gone now. The message I got from school, from TV and movies was basically, I'm an American, but not quite. Wrong color. Maybe I'm three-fifths of an American. The public schools teach even less. Hawaiian language itself was illegal to speak in Hawaii until 1986. And in 2018, a professor from Maui, Kalikoa Ka'eo, was arrested for speaking Hawaiian in a courtroom, despite Hawaiian technically being an official language here. The only words that the business and imperial interest want you to know here is aloha and mahalo. Aloha, here's a lay for you as you get off of your air-conditioned plane with a fake Hawaiian woman on the side of it, owned by a white man in a mansion with a gaudy golden bird of paradise gate who makes three million a year. Aloha, as you step into an air-conditioned tour bus that then takes you to your air-conditioned high-thread count hotel to have Mai Tais on an artificial white sand beach and watch bastardizations of our sacred dances, also known as hula, perform for $7.50 an hour with cellophane grass skirts. Mahalo, thank you for enjoying our starvation wage prostitution of our culture, people, and island while we drive our 30-year-old Toyotas or take the bus back to the dilapidated favela and live 20 to a house and fight with each other over the money that we don't have for medical bills and cry into our ramen and get diabetes and die at the age of 39. This is what being indigenous Hawaiian has meant. It's meant having no idea who the hell you are because who you are has been obliterated. It means commodified versions of yourself, prostituted for the profit of foreign capitalists, and you forced to participate in your own for-profit humiliation for 40 years of your life until you die. It means being erased, abused, annihilated physically, mentally, and spiritually, and having no idea who your abuser truly is. I still get into arguments with my mom and dad to this day when I talk to them about decolonization. They say, 
Chris, we're all Americans now. Let's just be thankful for what we have. As they keep slaving away at the age of 70. Until they probably will die very soon likely. Teaching the children of aristocrat future owners of Hawaiian Airlines and the Sheraton for table scraps. I should also note that if you're Pacific Islander or Native Hawaiian, you're six times more likely to be shot by police per capita than white people. The world of Neofeud, where you have the equivalent of the palace at Versailles, literally floating above an endless cross between the Honolulu slum, a Brazilian shantyscape, and a mega landfill, is just sort of taking my own experiences and cranking the knobs to 11. It's a world where the marginalized, robots and chimera part humans and the poor have to pass a consciousness test to even be considered a person and are easily discarded, disappeared, used for slave labor to prop up a prison industrial complex. It's a reflection of the sick nature of blood quantum, racial and class discrimination uh, in hiring, SAT, apartheid, etc. The countless kids I work with who were sent off to prison making Amazon Whole Foods products, including vegan and non-vegan cheese, for 25 cents an hour for the rest of their lives. There's a very difficult scene where the player character is actually asked to do a CPS examination of a robot family's home. They have a government issue checklist to fill out. Is there access to clean water? But they don't have it because they've reconfigured the tap to spout Valvoline oil. But they're robots, they don't need water. What do you put down for them? Do they have safety hazards? There is a smelting furnace with a hot liquid metal in the kitchen where the dad is melting down old Coke cans and bits of aluminum bikes to make replacements for cyber arm parts because they can't afford the refurbishment care. Technically, it's unsafe, but if you answer the form uh, properly, this family will lose their child, whom they obviously love and care about. Like so many native Hawaiians have had their children stolen because they don't fit the standards, the artificial standards, and also the and, the and they are in situations which are constructed by the colonizer. What follows is the militarized SWAT police coming in and doing what police in America do dozens of times a day to unarmed innocent people of color, including kids that I've worked with. It's a very difficult scene, which many people have cried through or they said that they felt like throwing up. But at the same time, they also say it's the best or most important scene in Neofeud. With Neofeud, I had an intention of reaching a wider audience to at least attempt to make enough money to pay for food, rent, and healthcare, and have a self-sustaining indie game company. I'm no longer on the hellscape Manhattan in the tropics ultra America that is Honolulu, Hawaii. I'm on the big island of Hawaii, which still has some actual Hawaii in it. I'm running a worker co-op on the big island with my wife in a house where we can actually breathe and the water isn't polluted with chromium-6 like where I'm from making science fiction games growing food and stopping desecration on our sacred mountain Mauna Kea by obsolete telescope projects that are useless to the astronomers but lucrative for six-figure university admins and Silicon Valley billionaires as part of the Kia'i of Pu'u Hulu Hulu All you Model X-800s were melted into hot slag when the Thermion bombs leveled the city we lost a lot of good civilians that day. Lost my leg to a depleted uranium round and cooked my motherboard. But I reformed, friend. I've opened up my third eye. War, huh? What is it good for? Keeping the bullet farmers in business, I guess. Ah, don't get me started on the military industrial complex. Makes me just want to terminate every last one of those. <sighs> Happy place. Happy place. Hey, you stay righteous, my good buddy. Flower power.
Uh, hi everyone, so this is Vess. Um, I had my microphone muted the first time doing this, so that's good. Alright, so today I'm going to talk about Umurangi generation more from sort of like an indigenous um, layer, I guess. So the game's kind of like layered in its approach where uh, very surface layer, it's about a thing, which I won't spoil. Um, second layer, it's about a thing that's very kind of now and current, what's going on. And then the third layer is a very, I guess, indigenous layer to like what what what's sort of going on there. And I guess um, to think about this, I'm going to talk more about from this game, more from that layer, I guess. And I will reference the other ones, but or, or to some extent, just not to spoil anything for people who haven't played. Um, but I guess to start with, what we're going to have to talk about is indigenous knowledge. Um, so indigenous knowledge is probably a term you've heard. Uh, it's probably something that you've heard um, people say. It's it's going through its bit of a, I guess, BTS stage. We have a lot of people using that term, but they don't know the words. They don't actually know what it means. Um, and, and that's mainly uh, white people, but I'm not going to go into that. Um, the idea is that, like, so the easiest way to start with this for people coming in and you don't know what this means, uh, it might be easiest to start with, like, what Western knowledge is. Um, because we've all had that, you know, smashed into our heads since birth. Um, and the idea being that, like, so Western knowledge is pretty much based on, you know, Plato and Homer and all those Greek philosophers and scholars and stuff from way back. And, you know, their stuff is all based in this idea of the Cartesian plane and, you know, knowledge resting between your ears and things like that. And, you know, all this stuff that's really based in, um, you know, the backbone of what Western thinking is, you know, ontology, epistemology, all that stuff, right? Um, so the idea with indigenous knowledge is to say that's actually not the only way of thinking and that our knowledge is just as valid. Um, we have our own ways of, you know, knowing what is true. We have our own ways of knowing, um, you know, the way the world works. And we have, you know, our own concepts of, you know, not this idea of knowledge existing between your ears, but, you know, it's alive and around us. Um, and so I guess my, um, wh why I'm introducing you to this is because uh, this game uses a sort of design framework that's based on indigenous knowledge by um, the our Radri designer named um, Professor Norm Sheen. Um, and so uh, Norm, he was my boss for six years and he taught me this stuff and, and helped me grow into that. So um, the idea with respectful design essentially to, to really I guess give an example here would be that you know traditional design says that the designer designs and they do human-centered design and and this idea that the designer is the smartest person in the room and they bring things together and they um, create right so an example could be that a designer says I'm going to go to a village and I'm going to create a modular system where you can make all these tools stick together and they will create a, you know, a pump and then you can take this bit out and it'll make a shovel and, you know, all this, this stuff, right? Um, so the idea is the designer says, here's your solution, bang, right? Uh, respectful design, I think, operates more under the assumption that community has actually the best answers and that it's actually the designer's job to listen. Or the idea being that um, community knows what's going on much better than the designer, right? And so um, the example to, to push back on that first one would be that with respectful design, the designer would go to that community and they would listen and the community would say, hey, we don't want a well built there because that's where the copper is or the you know poisonous whatever, right? That's where the water is going to be real bad for you. Um, we want one up there because we know that's actually where it's supposed to be. And if the designer listens, they'll come up with the best solution for community, right? Now, you must be thinking to yourself, how does that relate to video games? Or is that even something you can even really think about with that? Now, the idea with that is that um, if you're going to put that in a video game, which is what I've tried to do, uh, is you've got to really step back as the architect of the video game and you've got to let the players decide what's good and what's not. So in this game, which is about photography, uh, when you take photos, it classifies them. Maybe that's the best word. It, it says that what's in the photo or, or how's the photo looking. And if it's kind of, a you know, like, have you done that shot a bunch of times, um, which doesn't really matter. Like you still get stuff for it. But the idea is to say that 
players are actually the smartest people in the room when it comes to saying what they think looks good. And players can judge what looks good. So when they take a photo in the game, they're going to say to themselves, ah, I know what that photo looks like if it looks good to me, and they're going to be the ones to judge it. They're going to come up with the uh, judging or scoring of the game. They're going to say, that's a photo I'm proud of, and that's a photo I'm not, right? And as a designer, the idea is to step back and say, we're all artists here, <laughs> there's no good photos, because we're all, we're all just doing it, right? And, and the game is not going to say to players, that's a good photo, or that's a bad photo, or you shouldn't do it like that, or you have to do it like this, because once you start to introduce that kind of design, um, that very, you know, westernized idea of design, you're going to start to get players who are going to fall into patterns um, and rhythms and routines that are going to not make photos that they want to do, it's going to be photos that they are conditioned to do. They're going to make what they what the game tells them is a good photo, right? And to some extent, like, with this game, there is, like, a money system, and that's, like, you know, originally the idea was to have that money in there so that, like, players would finish a level and then they'd have all that money sucked away because they'd be starving artists, right? But left it in because, you know, we took took the starving artist idea out and then, like, left it in, uh, you know, just because, like, well, don't want to pull it out. It's going to stuff the whole thing up, right? Um, now, the idea is that, like, uh, with uh, this game, um, as players begin to play the game, they're not just learning how to play the game. They're also learning, like, practical skills of photography as they go to start to play. Um, and so the idea of that is that as players begin to play this game, they will eventually, um, you know, they start with a very basic lens and it's just like three editing options. And as they kind of grow through it, they get a little bit more knowledge and a little bit more learning. And then by the end, they've got all the tools that they kind of need to just express themselves and create photos. And we've seen this actually a couple of times now where, uh, you know, you see someone tweet out, oh, I just got this game. I'm not creative, I'm not an artist, I don't, whatever. Uh, get, they do the first level, ah, uh, yeah, okay, well, it looks kind of good, but the game made me do it, right? By the end, they're actually doing, like, really incredible stuff, and they're very uh, proud, and they're putting a lot of, um, you know, thought into how they take the photos. And the idea of that is, with respectful design, you give community the agency to do as they would, right? So the idea is that in this space, um, we say, you're the photographer you've got the agency to take the photos how you want and that's good you know what i mean um yeah so <laughs> moving on to the next part uh we can talk a little bit about like what was it like working in a team or solo or whatever so this this game was essentially made in eight months uh solo mainly by me and thor who did the music um and he actually contributed a couple of ideas which i think really fit um, for starters, he showed me what Kowloon was, which made me go, whoa, this is a piece of concept art come to life. Um, yeah. So the idea was, like, when I think about all that stuff and, and working solo on these projects, I think something that we've got to all remember is that as, like, Indigenous people, we're not just working solo. We've got, you know, all those guys behind us watching our backs on this stuff. And I think the idea with that is that, like, when we're doing this, um, it's kind of the idea that you've got to tread kind of lightly on certain topics. Um, and the reason I kind of say that is because, like, so much has already been taken. And, you know, the last thing you want this to be is the sort of tourist exploitive thing. And I think the idea with this uh, game was that, you know, like, it's very clear to me watching people play some people did go in thinking it was the tourist thing and then by the time they got out of the other end they realized that um the mirror that it holds up was something that actually they connected to which is another part of this respectful design thing um so just just not to spoil anything but when we're talking about like what this game's about Essentially, we could say it's kind of about neoliberalism or ne or how neoliberalism, like the beast, sort of moves through spaces. Um, and if, like, we track through that and, and look very specifically about what it's doing um, and how it, you know, how it breathes, 
you know where it sleeps things like that uh you know like what does it look like in marketing you know how do people talk about it things like that right and and that's what this game tries to do um the idea is that like uh when players do play this game um eventually i think towards the end and we've seen this happen there's players who walk away with interpretations that fit they fit with the tone and the idea of it but they're very personal they're reflexive they 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 look at that and they go ah okay i get it i get it and i get it because it's talking to me personally right and that's good right and that's that's probably about layer two right so layer one if you play it (laughs) you'll see layer one quite easily layer ones are very much a like uh, it's very much i guess a layer where you look at it and you go ah okay i get what's going on i've seen that before i get it right layer two is a little bit more meta it's a little bit more looking under the surface and seeing what's 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 going on and then layer three i think is the more um you know indigenous layer that we can probably all pick up on uh you know to not spoil anything there's a level called invasion um yeah so looking through all that stuff uh I think something that we should also, I guess, talk about, you know, if we can see the footage here and things like that, it's that um, this game is sort of set in a cyberpunk space, and the idea around that was to sort of uh, look at what cyberpunk actually should be, and so Mike Pondsmith, who's sort of the guy who's, you know, who brought cyberpunk into a game space, not like the original author or anything, but... Uh, he said something which I can't find the quote of, but I do remember him saying it. It was something about the idea that, like, it's always got to be this reflective thing of what's going on currently, right? And to me, that kind of read is this idea that, like, with a lot of cyberpunk stuff that um, has become sort of genre fair and cliche and things like that, uh, it's all reflective of what was going on in the 80s. So you've got, uh, you know, mega corporations just. Dis- doing whatever the fuck they want right which yeah that's the 80s uh you've got steroid fueled machines mostly like arnie and, and things like that. that's the 80s all right and then the the you know other stuff like drugs and and racial uh, racial problems or, or issues you know what i mean like if you've got the, the black and white stuff going on right there um that's very much about what's going on in the 80s so the idea with this game was to say what does that look like if you're doing it in 2020 or or, or what do you what does that look like if you're doing it in contemporary you know last five years right um so yeah with this idea when you play the game you'll probably start to see that what's going on under the surface there is or or the reflection of what's being shown is there's a crisis event and you're in a space where it's gotten to the point where like ads are referencing it but they're not talking about what the problem is right um and with this dlc coming out maybe next month pretty much next month i'm pretty not sure when this is i'm pretty sure this is going live in october so anyway the the idea is that um the you know you play the the you play the the game and i think with the dlc we're going to explore another little nugget of what's going on at the moment but underneath all of that i think uh is sort of like i guess like an indigenous layer i'm trying not to spoil too much but like when we look at all this stuff it's not new so when we look at uh what's going on say in you know america or something like that right that's not new that's been there for ever since those guys got off the boat right um when we look at say uh you know like neo-fascism that's come up that's not new either and so, yeah, the idea is to sort of, like, look at that stuff, but also remember that these these aren't new problems. They're the same problems, just, you know, given a, a, a bit more of a, like... They've give, been given a facelift, essentially, right? Like, anyone who's been paying attention knows that, like, fascists or neo-Nazis in, in, in the States, their whole thing was about rebranding to be uh more palatable to white people so rather than saying white genocide they say white culture and people who aren't receptive to that yet go ah well why would you have a problem with that 
So, yeah, to move into the next little bit, which is, you know, why was it important to make this game? Um, I can think of mainly three things that sort of um, sit in this space. Um, so, first of all, I guess there's the learning component that comes from photography. I got this sort of idea to make this game when I was sort of sitting with my little cousins and taking photos with them, showing them how to use the DSLR. And the idea around that was to say, like, teaching, you know, a skill is also a great way of, you know, planting seeds to, to sort of get people to realise certain things about themselves, right? So, um, the idea with this game is to sort of uh, get players to learn, you know, how to play the game and, and, and also the photography side that they can take outside of the game. But there's also, I guess, the slow introduction of certain things where because the player is in that space as an active participant hopefully they'll come away with a few seeds planted about what's um what's going on in that 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 area right and because it doesn't really go into touristy stuff um i, I think it helps with getting it so that people go through it and they go oh okay i know what that thing is now because i took a photo of it you know i know what a mania is because the photo of it and hopefully if they they look around what that thing's about they'll know you know kind of like what a mania is like you know it's a protection type thing um and i guess the other thing for me uh what was important for me was to sort of help build my own uh you know foundation my own strength in myself um around all this stuff like i'm living in aussie um and it is what it is like you know I, like we got flown over here pretty young right so I didn't learn a lot of this stuff and so the idea was um, you know as I did start to come back to culture and, and learn that kind of thing um, the idea was to, to walk slow and and you know soak a lot of it in and listen and, and be patient with it um, but the, also the idea was to to you know start creating and build that stuff up to where I could um, start to have you know a bit more strength in knowing myself and and knowing um, you know where that stuff sits and where it fits together. And so um, with with all this stuff, you know, one of the things which you learn pretty quickly um, when you look at games like that are that are around is um, you know there's this idea that when Maori people are portrayed in games. It's usually as a warrior or as a skin with some face paint, right? That looks like shit. Um, you know, it's, you know, ooga booga, ooh, we're going to get you kind of stuff, right? It's, it's, it's not authentic. It's not, uh, like it's insulting, right? And so the idea with this game was to sort of say that, um, you know, we're still here. Um, this idea that there's no real Maori left. Get the fuck out of here, right? Like, the idea is that uh, when we see these, um, you know, people in the game, they are, you know, uh, they're, they're wearing contemporary clothing. They, um, you know, they don't really go into stereotypes and things like that. And instead, it's uh, a more, like, honest look at, you know, the fact that we still live now and if you know the future that exists in this game was to happen we'd still be there and um that's you know a thing i think which games don't seem to really acknowledge much and you know it's not just my culture that does that uh you know it's not just indigenous culture that does that it's, it's a lot of stuff you know like um Let's say, for example, if you're Scottish, I'm pretty sure you're pretty bloody sick of the bagpipes getting shoved in your face whenever a Scottish person shows up in a game, right? And that's not to say don't be proud of the bagpipes, but more, you know, there's more to us than just the things you think. And so, you know, making this game, the idea was, um, you know, we're not a static culture, and we're not um, people who are, you know what these, you know, systems believe we are, right? It's all a myth to begin with. <laughs> That's just my cat. Um, so, 
yeah i think i might wrap it up there but yeah the idea of this game go play it i think um it's probably going to be in the future talking a little bit more about this game and i think um there's a lot i guess to look at and when you play the game try and sort of think about what it's looking at um take your time with it be slow <laughs> um yeah anyway i'll uh, see you next time well I hope you had a wonderful time. I hope you saw some really cool games that you really enjoyed listening to all our devs and everything they had to say about their games, how it was working on it, why they even worked on it. And this was such a great opportunity to see brand new games that I've never seen before. So I hope you had as much fun as I did watching these talks. If you wanna know more about our game devs, you can check them out as part of the InDigital space, which is happening for the rest of the weekend. Or you can go and check out their tw Twitter pages, their Steam pages, any of the information that we posted tonight or will post on the website, just so you can go and reach out to them on your own time, on your own terms. So thank you again for coming. I want to give a big miigwech to Night of the Indigenous Devs, uh, all the participants of Night of the Indigenous Devs, um, Chichi Miigwech to Imaginative for being our host and making this happen. And a huge thank you to our main sponsor, Eastside Games. Thank you for your continued support in growing up this next generation of Indigenous game devs. So thank you again for coming, and I hope you had a wonderful time. Good night.